Hello ladies and gentlemen of the internet. Finally we're back to PT part 2. I'm going to try and keep up the schedule of two weeks between each PT video. I'm trying to mix the channel content up a bit more so it's not only these project videos but also videos explaining things and specifics a bit more in depth. I think this way I'll be able to explain certain important aspects of the process a bit more slowly while less stuff is happening for you on screen. The project videos will keep coming, so, so don't worry. Soon I'll make some casting videos in as well for those interested in that. For this video, there's going to be a little bit less talking than you're probably used to. In the last two videos, there was a lot of explanation. And so I think I'll let the video do most of the explaining this time around. And instead, I'll talk about something else, which is pressing through even though sculpting gets hard and frustrating. And, and you feel like you fail, so working past those emotions. But first, our weekly Patreon interlude. For those of you looking to learn sculpture, but have not found any mentors, or for those of you who like the content this channel provides, and would like to contribute a small sum to its continued existence and hopeful improvement, check out my Patreon page. On Patreon, you can donate whatever sum you see fit and get something in return. Now this can be small things like sculptures to feedback and critiques on your own work by me and discounts in my soon to be web store so check it out, the link is in the description below. Okay so as I block in the figure and before I start talking about pressing through failure, I'll mention some of the stuff going through my mind at this point of the process. At this point I am busy blocking in the figure and trying to establish my contours. I'll make a video explaining contours in depth very very soon, but for now I'm trying to block them in without making the contours too wide. Remember, widths are flexible and heights are not. So I'm trying to establish my sculpture as best as I can using the heights that I've observed and measured, and at the same time staying inside my overall widths meaning I don't want to reach my eventual borders yet. You should only reach these borders when everything is accurately established. By staying slightly underbuilt, we allowing ourselves to make adjustments and make mistakes as well that we can then fix. So we're flexible. Now you've heard that before, I guess. If we press too far ahead and start having to make adjustments and changes and the sculpture has reached its final widths, things tend to get messy really fast. The process slows down and sculpting fun turns into a lot of frustration. We start having to carve into the clay to make changes. However, I have another more important reason I think for not wanting to reach my wits until everything is established to my satisfaction. And that is the same reason that I want to establish exciting gesture for example at the beginning of the process. It becomes very hard to establish good gesture later in the process. And I think the same goes for contours. Not only how it appears from one view, but how it travels back and forth in space as well. You see, the contour does not sit on a line. It jumps closer and further away from us depending on what form it belongs to. In certain areas, the forms that make up an angle break in the contour are not even close as far as depth goes. And establishing this moving contour gets very very hard once we reach the borders of our sculpture. This is why I try my best to get close to my borders, but then pay close attention as I start establishing internal information or forms. The internal information I establish helps inform me if my heights were correct. If my forms fit the way they're supposed to, then I've got the heights right. Of course, I could get the forms wrong and this might throw me off as well, but in general it's easier to judge the heights of small, smaller forms than the longer distances. Shorter is always easier than long. But the internal information is also integral to my contour, because it is my contour. You'll also notice how I establish these forms. I draw them out and establish them from, from the center, leaving the area where forms meet more or less empty. These are transition areas and it's better to leave these until later. Leaving these big gaps keeps the sculpture very easy to visually observe. Nothing is going to get lost or confused. And I can go from less specific to more specific. 
It also give me gives me flexibility, and, and there's that word again, right? Flexibility. Because having space in between each form means that I can move and shift things around easier, essentially allowing me to block in the entire figure, yet keep it very, very flexible. There's this thing that's, that's really easy to grasp and understand when someone says it, but it's very, very hard to do. And that is sculpting in a manner that would allow you to create sculpture that is close enough to the model to make it easy to observe and compare sculpture to model, yet flexible enough to make the necessary changes. This is very, very difficult, but I find that this technique is as close as I've gotten. And it's not my idea or, or something I came up with by any stretch of the imagination. I've learned from, from many people and too many to mention here, really. And perhaps I'll do a video on, on the sculptors and artists that influenced and, and taught me tremendously one day. I think that's a good idea. A video about inspiring people. While using this technique though, you have to be willing to make the necessary changes. Which brings me to the account of what happened on today, the day that I record this audio. If you haven't noticed already, these videos are obviously not shot the same day that you see this. So the sculpture is way further along than, than you see here in the video. Now if you follow me on Instagram, you'll, you'll know this. You, you will see how far the sculpture is along. So, what happened today while sculpting? I attempted the most difficult thing, I think, when sculpting figurative sculpture, at least the most difficult for me, and that is sculpting the head on the body. And of course, I'll, I'll talk more about how to do it and what more specifically went wrong, or rather not really wrong, but that didn't go so great when, when we get to it in the video series. But let's just say that I, that I fell victim to a couple of traps that I always warn against. And I always warn you against as well. I became impatient and I lied to myself and pushed forward past the stage of flexibility, thinking that perhaps things would improve if I progressed them further. This is a good lesson, I think, and one I seemingly completely forgot today. And that is that things rarely improve by pushing them forward when they already suck. Now, I'm sure they, they sometimes do, sometimes they improve, but if you're... If your boyfriend is an asshole, marrying him is not going to solve that issue. He's still going to be an asshole, except now you're married to him, which is obviously not ideal. This sculpture had gone really, really well up to this point. Everything had be really been a breeze and nothing had, had gone wrong yet. And all the pieces to the puzzle were falling into place one by one. And I really felt like I, like I had this down, you know? But Somehow, almost every sculpture finds a way to, to throw you a curveball when you'd least expect it. Now, it kind of went in a way that's even worse than if I just was unable to do it. It actually went well. The portrait, and the beginning of the portrait, I guess, is looking very, very cool. It's very accurate, pretty accurate at least, and it's pretty damn good. I like the, I like the pose of it and all that, but at the same time, it's not right. Even though I measured it, it still ended up being ever so slightly too small and positioned perhaps ever so slightly wrong, making the neck a little bit short perhaps. And instead of adjust adjusting it while I could and I should, I told myself it was because of the tilt of the head or because I had yet to grow the head in widths. And of course none of these things are true. I knew it. I knew it. I mean, looking back at it, I knew that it was wrong and I should have done something. but. I really liked the beginning of the blocking, so I wanted them to be true, and I lied to myself. And I deceived myself, and I wasted three hours of model time, and I essentially ruined the rest of my day. So why would I, why would I tell you this, even though it's not in today's video? Even though it's not here in the video, me sculpting this? Because I, I think there's a valuable lesson to be learned from this, you know, for myself and for everyone. I like this sculpture a lot up until today, but today's mess up has me, me feel pretty bad about it, you know? But this has already, this has also happened to me before and I know that all that needs to happen is that I essentially stop lying to myself, suck it up and fix whatever is wrong, no matter how much backtracking needs to happen. You see, I think that perhaps it doesn't matter how competent or good you ever get at something, you're probably gonna make a mistake every now and then. And if I didn't 
If I didn't put these videos out, or posted pictures of my work in progress, no one would ever know that I messed anything up, right? It would just look like nice pieces of work. But I think everyone gets frustrated with their work, and everyone makes mistakes. And I think, I think it's, that's an interesting lesson to learn as well. I think the difference is, are you gonna press through it and, 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 and fix your mistakes? Or are they gonna end up being mistakes in the finished work? Because at the end of the day, all that really matters is the finished piece. The head on the dereliction of self, for example, was a complete mess. And it drove me insane. I, I even cut the head off and I put, a, I put a gigantic wooden pole down into the sculpture. And I em hollowed out the head and did all these crazy things to put the head in a better, in a better spot. Essentially lengthening the neck. But I think the most important thing is that nobody really knows that. Nobody saw that if they weren't there. And I was able to work through it. I was able to be honest with myself and, and fix it. And as of now, that's the only big sculpture that I've ever sold. To a museum in Barcelona, nonetheless. And I had some visitors last weekend in, in the studio showing them around the school. And they were from Barcelona. And they told me that it's, it, it's on, still there on display, which is amazing. So even though I messed up today, I'm pretty sure I can fix it. And if you mess something up on your sculpture, you can fix it. So I guess what you should take away from this little, little story is that Stop lying to yourself. You're, you're fooling no one but yourself. So with that off my chest and the tough lesson learned and passed on to you, hopefully out of the way forever, I can talk a little bit about sculpting again and why I don't sculpt the two legs and the head and the arms at the same time, at the same time as I block everything else in. Let's start with the legs. So depending on the pose, the body will only have a structurally important relationship with one leg. In this case, the model puts weight on his right leg, so from now on we'll refer to his right leg as the stand leg. The other leg we'll call the balance leg. The balance leg is not important structurally as it doesn't hold up much weight, it only serves to balance the body and it's therefore often moving, it's, it's not very stable, so it's moving a lot more than the stand leg. The stand leg has a direct relationship to the body and this relationship is vital in providing the figure with balance. And we discussed this in the plumb line video two weeks ago. There's a link in the top right corner to that video. Because it holds most of the weight, it's more stable and therefore it moves less and it's the logical place to start. We need it established to provide the figure with balance and it plays a vital role in the gesture of the figure. The balance leg is more of a free-for-all. We can establish it later in the process and we can make many different choices as to its gesture. The gesture I've chosen is not the one that my model is giving me on a day-to-day -day basis. For the most part, he is in a more classical contrapposto, but I've chosen this striding pose for various reasons. The sculpture is about an onward and upward type of attitude, so it fits the mood and atmosphere I'm trying to portray more than a traditional contrapposto does, I think. It's also a technical challenge for me, piecing together different parts of the body from different poses is very difficult, but it's also quite freeing, allowing me to rely on one or two or three poses instead of only copying the one pose that I see. So it allows me freedom to design the sculpture I want and portray the atmosphere that I'm after, which is a great challenge and, and something that has made this sculpture quite enjoyable. The arms are very much the same way. There are certain things that are important from a structural standpoint that need to be solved early and work in relationship with not only each other but also the solid 
core of my armature. Now this is the torso and the stand leg. And the arms are not part of this, not structural at all. At this, at this point in the process, the arms can literally turn into anything. To remain flexible, it's best to wait because the arms need the shoulder girdle to attach to the body. And the shoulder girdle locks in the height of the shoulder, the pit of the neck and the C7. This early on, I'm not interested in locking these into place in case there needs to be changes made, which there most certainly and usually and probably will be. From a materials perspective, it's also not wise to build them too early because they dry out very fast because they're thin and I'm using water-based clay. So it's better to wait with the arms until later. The head is the same thing, it also rests atop the shoulder girdle and should not be placed until the shoulder girdle is confidently placed. As we already spoke about, moving or removing a head is a nightmare, so you want to avoid it as much as you can. As, as I mentioned, I've run into, into issues on the head on this sculpture. I imagine if you've made it this far into the videos, into this video, sorry, you are somewhat convinced that I'm, I'm somewhat competent at this sculpting thing, and, and so heed my warning, I, I've been down this road. The head is hard. Portraits are hard, and the only thing that I think is harder than a portrait is a portrait on top of a body. Now I also think it's possible to wait too long, which is another mistake I think I made on this sculpture, but we'll speak more about that once, once we get to it in a couple of videos. If I were to leave you with some closing thoughts, they would be portraits are hard, stay patient, and don't lie to yourself. It's better to own up to a mistake and fix it.
I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did, I encourage you to check out my Patreon page. I give feedback and critiques on people's work and we talk about whatever you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. There are several, several rewards, one of them being the maquette for this sculpture that you've seen me working on today. So check it out, the link is in the description below. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for a new video next Thursday. Subscribe to the channel and hit the little bell to be notified whenever a new video comes out. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button and share it with your friends and family. It helps me out a lot. Thank you for watching, stay creative and I hope to see you in the next one.